Let's begin our worship and song this morning by standing and singing, pray all the time. The world has lost the right of prayer, and saints have failed to pray. What loss sustained beyond repair, how blind of heart are they? In preparation for Lord's Supper, we'll sing the Lord's Supper. Divine all else surpassing. 
so good to be able to be together and to worship God and to assemble around the table now at this time and remember our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <clears throat> In a world that tends to reject God and mock Christianity more and more, those of us who believe in God with all of our heart, soul, and strength are more than ever thankful for the knowledge of what Jesus did for us at the cross. And now we long to see him and to be with him someday. Past week I was driving around in my truck and Alan Jackson came on the radio and he was singing the song, The Old Rugged Cross. And for whatever reason, it really hit me hard that day. <laughs> and after it was over, I turned the radio off and I tried singing it again and I couldn't remember all the verses. So I looked it up and uh, meditated on them a little bit. And that song is so meaningful. The words of it are so meaningful. Um, before we partake this morning, I just thought I'd just recite the words or the lyrics to that, to that song uh, as we prepare our minds to partake of the emblems. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see, for twas on that old cross that Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. To that old rugged cross I will ever be true, its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to a home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish that old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged, rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? Our kind and loving Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this Lord's Day, for the beauty of this day, for allowing us to all to be able to freely come here and to worship you this day. Father, it's our, our prayer this morning that every soul that is here this morning might be here because we want to be, because we love you and we want to worship you. And at this time, we want to thank you so much for your love for us in sending Jesus to earth. Father, we thank you for your word and for the example we have of how we ought to live our life through the days that Christ walked here on this earth as a man. We pray that we might do our best daily to follow the pattern that he sent for us, that we might reflect him and all that we do and say as we go through our daily lives. Father, at this time as we partake of this unleavened bread, we pray that we might be mindful of the body of Christ as he gave it there that day on that old rugged cross and allowed himself to be a sacrifice for our sins that we might have reconciliation with you through uh, his sacrifice on the cross. We just pray that we might never partake of this in an unworthy manner and we might take this time to reflect upon our own uh, life and service to you and that we might be doing all we can to be more like him each and every day. We just thank you again for your love and we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.
Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've afforded us to come around this table and to, to remember your son. Father, as we take this cup, help us to remember Jesus' shed blood on the cross, Jesus' <coughs> willingness to freely go to this earth to, to be a sacrifice. Help us to remember the pain and suffering that he had went through and the humiliation. And Father, we thank you for your, your plan f- of salvation for us, the, the hope we have of life with you someday in heaven. We thank you for your son and, and the love that he had to uh, dedicate his whole life um, for, for the forgiveness of our sins. We ask this prayer through your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Take this time now to give back to the Lord such that we've been prospered, that we might uh, continue to evangelize the area here in our mission works and uh, support the financial costs that go along with uh, the work involved here. Um, wouldn't it be great to see our Savior face to face someday uh, when this world comes to an end and, and we are called home? Uh, but until that point, uh, the best way we can thank our Lord and Savior for what he did for us at Calvary is to continue the ministry that he began while he was here on this earth and to share the good news of Christ with uh, those that aren't, haven't heard it or um, uh, are, have a huge void in their life and they don't know what it is and we need to do all we can to try and uh, spread the gospel. So at this time, let us be thankful for what God's blessed us with and, and use our talents and abilities and our financial means to further his kingdom. And uh, we just want to have hearts of gratitude towards the Lord, and we want to do all we can to be the best servant for him and do uh, what we can to, to help his kingdom. Um, Brother Ray, would you offer a prayer of thanks, please? Let us bow. Dear Righteous, Holy, Heavenly Father, we thank you today so much for the opportunity to gather together and to give back a portion of which we have been blessed by you back into your kingdom so that we can continue the furtherance of your work. Father, we pray that each and every one who has an opportunity to give does so in a cheerful manner and with the full faith and knowledge 
that these collections being taken are being used to the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, we thank you so much for all the many blessings you have given us. We know that we are so incredibly blessed and in everything that we have been given, we are to be stewards of. And Father, we pray that today everybody that would be uh, adding to that collection, Father, would know that their, that their contribution is going to be effectively used for your kingdom. We thank you so much for your son and for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Pierce my ear, O Lord, my God. Take me to your door this day. I will serve no other God. Lord, I'm here to stay. For you. Song before Brother Matt's lesson this morning will be Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And if it's convenient for you, would you please stand while we sing the song? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer. Our song of encouragement after Brother Matt's lesson will be Prepare to Meet Thy God. Today's scripture will be from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 5 through 10. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fall to meet the test, I hope you will find 
out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed, f failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak, and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. good to be back. Um, you know, I'm thankful that I have elders here who take good care of me, and one of the things that they do is send me to places like PTP so that I can, polishing the pulpit, so that I can learn and uh, hopefully bring some of that stuff back to you all as well, uh, but I'm grateful to them for uh, taking good care of me. Um, I do want to thank Dan for covering for me last week. I know he did an amazing job, and I appreciate that. And I do want to thank Rick and Travis and Mark for filling in for me on Wednesday night when I wasn't here the last several Wednesdays. I feel like I've been gone a lot, but it is good to be back with you all now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, Paul says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming uh, conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, of course, Paul wasn't referring to a, a literal thorn from a, a rose bush or a bramble, but he was using this word picture to describe some struggle that he was facing at the time. It, it was like a thorn had caught in his flesh and, and it had festered, it, it was infected. And every time life rubbed up against that thorn, it hurt. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there now. This morning, I'd like for us to consider how we can faithfully face the thorns in our lives and come out victorious in the end. But before we delve into how to face the thorns, there are a few things <clears throat> that I think we need to, uh, to lay as a foundation, a couple of, of concepts that we need to recognize. The very first thing we need to understand from this passage is thorns happen. Thorns happen, and they happen to faithful Christians. And if you're like me, there's this idea that you have in the back of your mind that says, when I've been doing what's right, when I've been serving God, when I've been trying to put sin aside, and I've been striving to pursue his holy will, surely in those moments what God's going to do is protect me from thorns. He's going to pamper me. He's going to make sure that none of those things can happen. But I want you to think about the guy who's telling us this. This is Paul, the apostle. 
The one who gave up everything in order to be a child of God. Who counted everything as loss. In order to have the righteousness that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. He had made all kinds of sacrifices. He had served the Lord. He had pursued holiness. And yet, this man is the one who is facing a thorn in the flesh. Now, we don't know exactly what the thorn was, though many have argued and strived to figure it out. The, sec the text simply doesn't tell us. And I think there's a good reason why the text doesn't tell us. Because if, if the text had told us what his thorn in the flesh was, we might be deluded into thinking that that's the only kind of thorn in the flesh. And, and not realize how this applies to us. And so the text leaves it open. But it does give a list of things that go along with the thorn in the flesh. He's, he's uh, talking about this thorn in the flesh. He comes around to verse 10 and he, and he talks about uh, what, he's, uh, what he'll be content with. He says, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Here we have a summary of the kinds of thorns in the flesh that we might face. Weaknesses. This word, as it's used, could mean different things. It could refer to physical ailment. Uh, this, this is the word that's often used just to say that somebody's sick. Sometimes it's used to describe physical shortcomings. When Paul talks about his poor ability to speak, he talks about a weakness. But it's also used, as in Hebrews 4, to refer to a spiritual weakness. And all of these things can be thorns in the flesh. The term insults. Paul went through numerous insults. The term seems to refer to any type of suffering that's caused by someone's insolence or impudence. How many times was Paul beaten because someone was insolent or impudent? And then those last three, uh, the last three terms, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, those seem to all be references to the same kind of thing. And if you back up uh, to chapter 11, in verse 23, chapter 11 and verse 23 is Paul talks about all these things that he went through. Labors, imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I was adrift at sea, on frequent journeys, in danger of rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, all those kinds of persecutions and hardships and calamities. Now, it's not just that these kinds of things can happen to Christians. These things happened to Paul because he was a Christian. And he prayed three times for the Lord to take it away. And the Lord's response in a word was no. And that's hard for us to grasp. And yet, the thing we need to understand is that thorns happen. And sometimes they don't go away quickly. Sometimes they linger. Sometimes until we pass from this life. And thorns don't mean that God has turned his back on us. Thorns don't mean that something is, is automatically wrong with you. Thorns simply mean that we're still alive. Thorns happen, and they happen even to faithful servants of God. Another aspect that we need to recognize and consider before we move on to how to face the thorns is, I'd like for us to think, uh, for a moment about uh, the relationship between God and Satan and our thorns. 
Notice what's said here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the, sur the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now in this text, it certainly appears, and I don't want to make a, any blanket statements about all thorns. But in this text, this thorn seems to have directly come from Satan. And the text demonstrates that God allowed it. And when we consider what it says in Hebrews 12, I think we find that some thorns come directly from God for discipline. Hebrews 12 and verse 5. Hebrews 12 and verse 5. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? <clears throat> Sorry. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he loves. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have, particip in which all have participated, then you are legit illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of the spirits and live? So the reality is that some thorns, some struggles, some hardships may come upon us because of discipline from the Lord. And I think we also recognize from Ecclesiastes 9, Ecclesiastes 9, that some thorns simply happen because of time and chance. In Ecclesiastes 9 and verse 11, the preacher says, Again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, for favor to, or, nor favor uh, to those with knowledge, but time and chance happen to them all. So I, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what we do learn about thorns in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it doesn't tell us where all the thorns ever come from directly. But it does demonstrate to us what Satan wants to do with whatever thorn you have. And what God wants to do with whatever thorn you have. No matter where that particular thorn came from. Satan wants to use the thorn to harass you and turn you away from God. But God wants to use the thorn to strengthen you and draw you closer to him. It was a messenger of Satan sent to harass. But God was using it so that Paul wouldn't be conceited. Satan wants to use whatever is going on in your life to get you to abandon God. God wants to use whatever is going on in your life to get you to turn to him and draw closer to him. That's how these two enemies are using the thorns that you face. So we have a thorn in the flesh and we're now face to face with this weakness, whether physical or spiritual. The insults that, that others hurl, the calamities, the hardships, the persecutions. How can we walk through that and come out the other side victorious? The first thing I think we should recognize from Paul is we need to remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 13, Paul comes back to this theme of weakness and strength. But this time he talks about Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 4, Paul says, speaking of Jesus, <clears throat> For he was crucified in weakness but lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but in dealing with you, we will live with him by the power of God. Jesus very literally faced thorns. And as Paul is facing his weakness, his 
hardships, his calamities. He remembers that Jesus isn't asking of him anything that he wasn't willing to endure himself. Jesus himself faced all of these things and still came through victorious. So when you're facing your thorns, God's not asking you to do something that he was unwilling to do himself. Jesus came in the flesh and dealt with the weaknesses of human flesh. He dealt with the insults, the hardships, the persecutions, the calamities. I don't know what you're going through right now. But you weren't the first to go through it. Jesus has been there. He's walked down that road. And we need to remember that. You're not alone. And having remembered that, the second thing we need to do is allow the thorns to lead us to God. We need to allow the thorns to lead us to God. Remember, we've already talked about the two enemies who want to use that thorn. Satan wants to use it to turn us away from God. But God wants to use that. He's hoping that it'll cause us to draw closer to him. How did Paul respond to his thorn? Did Paul go around complaining to people? Look, look at everything I've done for God. I can't believe this. You know, I gave up being a Jew. I was in this wonderful place. I was on a fast track to the council. And now look what God's doing. You know, I've, I, I've been beaten. I've been shipwrecked. What is going on? Is that what he's doing? No. No. Whatever this thorn in the flesh is that he's dealing with, instead of complaining to everyone about it, he prays. And he continues to pray. What did Paul's thorn in the flesh do? It turned him to God. Remember, there are two forces trying to use that thorn. And Satan is the one who's whispering in your ear, in your ear, see, God doesn't love you. If he really loved you, he wouldn't allow this thorn. That's not truth, whispering that. That's the enemy whispering that. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2 Corinthians 4, Paul talks about his life and his ministry. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul's recognizing that he's this jar of clay. He's this jar of clay, and all that he has is this jar of clay. That's all that he is. And so anything that's accomplished by him or through him is actually God. We are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted. Struck down, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Why? To demonstrate that God is the one who's victorious. So when he recognized the weakness, the, the persecution, the calamity, the hardship, the insults, it would turn him to God. Author Philip Yancey tells a story 
of a friend of his who, who was a recovering alcoholic. And his friend told him that it used to upset him greatly because every day he prayed that God would take away his desire to drink. I don't want to drink anymore. Please take it away. And yet, every morning, he'd wake up and the first thought that came to his mind was, I need a drink. He said that it angered him, it upset him, until he realized that it was that first thought that led him to his second thought. I need to pray. It was his weakness that led him to strength. It was his thorn that led him to God. Let your thorns lead you to God. Because they're a reminder that you're a jar of clay and you need him. And having turned to God and being led to God, trust that God knows more about thorns than you do. Trust that God knows more about thorns than you do. Trust that God knows more about this entire situation than you do. Trust that God understands where this can lead. I don't know when Paul figured out that the thorn in the flesh was actually helping him with potential conceit. You can imagine that having the kinds of revelations that he had and doing the kinds of work that he did and making the kinds of sacrifices that he made, it might be easy to look down on everyone else because they hadn't done everything that he had done. They hadn't experienced everything that he had experienced. Oh, the conceit that could have grown in his heart and in his mind. And so when Satan brought this messenger to, to, to harass him, God allowed the thorn to continue. So that it could humble him and remind him that everything he had comes from God. I don't know when Paul figured that out. Maybe he figured it out in the middle of it. Maybe it was because God spoke to him saying, my grace is sufficient for you. Maybe it was years later. And now, after years of considering that whole scenario, he's able to write this to the Corinthians. I don't know. But here's what I do know. You may not ever find the silver lining. But trust that God understands this thorn better than you do. And God can use it in ways that you can't even imagine. In Romans 8 and verse 28... In Romans 8 and verse 28, Paul says, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that happens to us will judge as good. What it means is God knows how to make it work for good. Trust that God knows more about the thorns than you do. And because you have trusted that God knows more about it, accept the thorns. Accept the thorns. God's response to Paul, there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, my grace is sufficient for you. He's saying, Paul, you don't need anything else. The grace that I give you is all that you need. Understand that God's not saying to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you to deal with this thorn. What he's saying is, this thorn is my grace, and it is sufficient. If you needed something else, if you needed the thorn removed, I would remove it. The grace that I allow in your life is what you need. Now, in my 
finite wisdom, or perhaps I should say my infinite arrogance, or ignorance, I should say, <laughs> ignorance. When things aren't going my way, when things aren't going my way, I tend to think that everything is just going awry. That it's, it's this great scandal. Because things aren't going my way. Why won't God work this out the way that I want him to? And why won't he do it in my timeline? What God is saying is, what I'm allowing in your life right now, is all that you need right now. My grace is, is sufficient. So, so just do what I tell you and accept that you have this thorn. Now, we can turn to God and try to convince him with all manner of argument that he needs to remove it. Sometimes we'll even try to manipulate God by saying, look at how much work I could do. Look at all the work I could do for you. Look, God, if you would just quit letting me get shipwrecked, you know, I could, I could make it places and I could preach the gospel. If you had removed this physical ailment, imagine the work I could do. But God says... My grace is sufficient for you. Accept it. But don't just accept it. Boast. Be glad for the thorns. Did you notice that Paul didn't just simply accept it? He says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He understood that it was only when he recognized his weakness and when he was able to be glad for it. And how it led him to God and opened up his heart for God to be able to work in him and through him. Only then could he truly have strength. I think this is a problem for us in a, as American Christians. Because here in America, we are all about independence. And personal strength and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. And, and you can handle this. But that's not true. And the longer you keep thinking that, the less the power of God can work through you. These thorns come upon us and, and, and so that we can recognize that I can't handle this. I can't handle it. And you know what? I'm glad for that. Because I'm reminded of how much I need God. Moses had to go through the rejection after slaying the Egyptian and running away. Because only then did he get to the point of realizing that he couldn't deliver Israel. Which then allowed God to work in him and through him so that he could. Don't just accept and, and resign yourself to thorns. Be glad that you've got them. Because it's the thorns that open us up to God and his strength. Let them turn you to him. And having remembered Jesus and having Turn to God, trusting that he knows more and not only accepting the thorns, but boasting gladly that God has allowed this to happen in your life. Turn to strengthen others. Turn to strengthen others. Paul talks throughout this letter about his own weakness and the people who insulted him because of his weaknesses that they saw in him. And then he gets to this point of saying, I'm glad for my weaknesses. 
And he even talks about Jesus and, and the weakness and, and the thorns that he went through. And then in 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, 2 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 5, he says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may have seemed to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. I read that whole paragraph because I wanted you to see the context. But notice that point smack in the middle. We are glad when we are weak and you are strong. We are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Paul was glad about his own weakness if he could use it to strengthen others. Paul was glad about his own weakness if he could use it to strengthen others. He didn't care if they thought he had failed the test. He didn't care if they looked at him and said, you're so weak, you're, you're, your physical presence isn't that great, your speaking ability is, is no good. He didn't care if they saw his thorn in the flesh and thought there must be something wrong with him. He didn't care as long as whatever he had could be used to strengthen others. So he said, that's what I pray for. That's what I pray for, that you will be restored, that you won't fail the test. Do you want to face the thorns victoriously? Turn to the Lord. Trust that he knows more about it than you do. And accept it. Boast and be glad in it. And then use it to strengthen others. And when you've done that, by the grace of God, you have overcome the thorns. If you'd like to, you can go ahead and put your Bibles and your notes away. We'll be singing a song in just a moment. If you're going to be using a song book, you can pull that out now if you'd like to. Otherwise, the words will be up on the screen behind me. gospel didn't come into the world so that we would miss the thorns. The thorns lead us to the gospel. Be glad. Because if, if God didn't allow you to have thorns, you wouldn't realize how much you need him. Every one of those struggles, every one of those Weaknesses, every one of those insults, hardships, calamities that you have faced. Satan wants you to get upset and turn away from God. 
But God wants you to realize how much you need him. And he wants you to realize that he is here for you. All you have to do is come. Come to him. If we can help you turn to God this morning, whether you need to become a child of his or whether you need to be strengthened in prayer because you are a child of his and you need the prayers of the congregation. Whatever it is we can do to help you this morning, you can let us know by coming to the front as we stand together and sing. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of God? Hear you not the invitation? Oh, prepare to meet thy God. Careless soul, oh, heed the warning. For your life will soon be gone. Oh, how sad to face the judgment. Unprepared to meet thy God. Why so thoughtless are you standing? While the fleeting years go by, and your life is spent in folly, oh, prepare to meet thy God, careless soul, oh, heed the warning, for your life will soon be gone, oh, how sad to face the judgment. Unprepared.